Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood Podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on YouTube. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Tango Shalom is now available on, on all, all VOD, VOD major platforms. platforms. <laughs> I think we missed that. Up. Video on demand, or as they say in the trade, VOD. VOD. Uh, Tango, Tango Shalom, Shalom is now, now available, available on, on all, all VOD, VOD platforms. platforms, which means video on demand. Look how you know. You must be a high school graduate. I'm a college graduate. Really? Yes. I got an honorary degree from Hofstra. My. Did you get an honorary degree? No, I got a degree. <laughs> oh, well, I got honorary. You know, I'm in the Jewish Museum. What for? What do you mean? As a famous Jew in you the are? Bronx. I'm in the famous... I have a, I'm in the Prospect Park in the, in the stones. How big is the stone? <laughs> Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your evangelist of the imagination. Hell. Your existential, Mr. Rogers. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett. I am Robcasting it. You, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the post geek singularity community. This is Robservations, episode number 758. You know, I woke up this morning, I had work to do, uh, had some coffee. Lo and behold, the Book of Boba Fett trailer. And, you know, I thought it was a, I, and I thought the, the trailer, I quite enjoyed it, but I love the, the premise of the show that Boba Fett, I mean, like I said, I tweeted out, oh my God, he's becoming like Cyrus in The Warriors. Can you count, suckers? I say the future is ours. If you can count, he's going to consolidate the underworld and the Star Wars universe and take control. Now, I don't know, uh, as we all know, there was going to be a live action Star Wars television series that they had written many of the, the episodes already. I think the all 50 were written or so, at some point. I'm not really sure about the whole background on this, but very exciting, very exciting nonetheless. Um, Boba Fett consolidating the criminal underworld in the Star Wars universe. Come on, what's not to love? Uh, what a great premise. Him and Fennec Shand, bring it on. Very exciting. Now, I thought that was going to be the excitement of the day. I was like, hmm. And it's damn exciting. It's pretty exciting. But... At 2 o'clock in the after, actually at 2.17, well, first of all, let me give you some background. One of my favorite authors working today is Dan Simmons. And Dan Simmons wrote, like, if you watch the miniseries The Terror about the boat stuck in the Arctic, uh, he wrote that book. And not a lot of his work has been adapted. He's written some amazing horror novels, Song of Kali, Carrying Comfort, he wrote that. Um, I have most of his books on the shelf. But one of my favorite books of his and my favorite books, well, my favorite books of all time are what are called the Hyperion Cantos. Now, the first book, where did I put it? First book, this, this is my first edition, of course, with Broad Art on it to uh, make sure the dust jacket stays mint. Hyperion. Actually, Hyperion was written as one book, but the publisher, which was Doubleday Bantam, the publisher made Dan Simmons, sorry, split these in half into two books. But it was written as one book. Uh, this is one of my favorite science fiction series of all time. 
And of course, as I am wont to do, uh, my copy is sign, signed. The only, uh, uh, the only autographs I ever collect anymore. Not that I ever collected autographs, but I, I, I used to go see a lot of authors and listen to readings and buy the books. And so this is the first of four. There are four. There's a Hyperion, Fall of Hyperion, and then there is the second series that he wrote later, uh, Endymion and Rise of Endymion. Now, I love the, 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 the Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion have been described as the Canterbury Tales in Outer Space about these pilgrims. Well, let me, let me read you a little bit about what Hyperion is all about. This comes from the Barnes & Noble um, blog, and it was written by John uh, Bardinelli, and this was written on April 9th, 2015. And um, it's, I don't know why, it's, 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 it's now locking up on me. I can't, uh, I can't seem to continue to move it. Here we go. Uh, the mind-altering scope of Dan Simmons' Hyperion Cantos. I don't know why it's not allowing me to do this. Um, see, I had this all popped up, but oh, there we go. Dan Simmons is an expert at playing the field. The author crosses genres more often than a chicken crosses the road, jumping from horror to fantasy to sci-fi to mystery to historical fiction with every other release. Maybe even all the stories at once. Simmons is best known in sci-fi circles for 1989's Hyperion and its other half 1990's The Fall of Hyperion, the first two volumes of the Hyperion Cantos. The first book is written as a frame story, stu uh, stuffing six separate, ultimately related tales inside one unifying narrative, while the second is a more traditionally told wrap-up story that only grows in scope to the final pages. 25 years after they were published, they remain vital, impressive works of science fiction. As everyone is fond of pointing out, mainly because it makes us sound smart, Hyperion borrows its structure from Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, only better, because instead of trudging to a boring old cathedral, the pilgrims of Hyperion are headed to another planet to do cool, sciencey things and maybe get murdered by a fearsome, many-bladed robot. The Shrike. Didn't think about adding that to your little book, did you, Chaucer? In the 28th century, humanity is spread across the galaxy, populating a number of disparate worlds with the aid of the World Web, which allows for instantaneous travel between planets. The World Web is run by the Technocore, an aggregation of AI machines that controls nearly all of mankind's technology, and lately, relations between man and the thinking machine have been less than cordial. Turning up the heat on this simmering conflict are the time tombs, mysterious structures that move backward in time, and a half-mechanical, half-supernatural being known as the Shrike that moves with them. No one knows quite what will happen when the tombs open, but everyone wants to be the first to find out. I'll give you one guess where the time tombs are located. Hint, it starts with an H and kind of rhymes with Loperian. The book uses the struggle between humans and machines as a backdrop for the real meat of the story. A group of travelers are heading to the tombs, each with hidden agendas and secret angst-ridden history. The frame structure allows each one to fill us in on the details as the group makes its long pilgrimage across a deserted planet. Simmons uses the stories to develop the universe well beyond immediate events, allowing us glimpses of distant worlds and tense battles across decades of time. Each character's life takes place in its own little microcosm. In one, a priest suffers the consequences of first contact with a truly alien species, while another follows a man losing his time-sick, backwards, de-aging daughter day by day. The tales don't seem to have much in common after the first read, but as the pilgrims progress in their intercantos adventure, Simmons gently turns up the serendipity until a dozen wow moments hit you. Hit your noggin, one right after another. The Hyperion Cantos would be a prized piece of science fiction for its world-building alone, but it's Simmons' ability to prop his world up with characters you come to care deeply about that keeps you hooked. Their emotional struggles are so integral to the plot, the two become inseparable. Mankind's quest for survival is mirrored dozens of different ways in the drama, from our desire to protect our children, to the pursuit of love, adventure, and art, or the simple fight to stay alive. And there's a time monster in space travel. Doesn't make it any less real. The first Hyperion book ends on a whopper of a cliffhanger, so make sure you've got a copy of The Fall of Hyperion handy when you start the series. Endymion and Rise of Endymion jump ahead nearly 300 years with a doozy of a plot hook. 
Far-casting singularities have been destroyed to protect humans from the Technocore, but without instantaneous travel, most civilizations are doomed. Uh, which they kind of ripped off for Star Trek Discovery Season 3, but oh, what hasn't Star Trek Discovery ripped off? So, whatever. Some of the characters from earlier books are still kicking around too, allowing the character development threads and tidy metaphors to persist across the centuries. Hyperion is also among sci-fi's most award-winning series. Across four books, they've earned Simmons three Hugo nominations and one win, two Locus Awards, and a Nebula nomination. Well deserved all. So there's a little brief uh, history about what Hyperion actually is. I love these books. I can't even my, my, my love for these books is boundless. And people, even like Martin Scorsese once was going to take a, a crack at Hyperion. I've wanted to see these books made, well, since I read Hyperion in 1989. Today, however, now, people have been trying. People have been trying. Now, I don't know how they could possibly make Hyperion into one movie. Like Dune, it's incredibly dense. I mean, I always saw it as a, as a series. But I have to tell you, Lately, I have been astonished by what we're getting in terms of entertainment. I've been astonished by the fact that on Netflix, Todd Grimson's book, Brand New Cherry Flavor, a book I have been talking about. It's not a particularly great book, but the series, which I haven't delved into yet, I just can't believe it got made. But that is a literary adaptation. We've, of course, got Dune in theaters now. We have Foundation. I mean, it might not be a direct adaptation of Foundation, which I don't even know how you would adapt directly because it's not kind of that book. But the fact that we're going to get Hyperion, oh wait, I haven't got around to saying what was happening with Hyperion yet, but I will. To me, uh, as everyone knows, I am a huge fan of science fiction, fantasy, and horror literature. I have a lot of it. And uh, I, we're getting the Wheel of Time saga, which Stubble McShave is still dancing naked around in his uh, Swedish apartment in, or with, or whatever he's doing, because he's excited. But the fact that we're getting some major literary um, genre literature adapted I mean, my God, uh, as much as I'm disappointed with Star Trek, current iterations of Star Trek, although I'll be doing a show on Star Trek Prodigy, um, which I don't think is disappointing, but it's just not Star Trek, but it's beautiful. Uh, anyway, so uh, I, will, I will talk about that probably tomorrow. But the fact that, that a new group of people is stepping up to tackle Hyperion is very exciting. So, as I said, at 2.17 this afternoon, Pacific Time, on Deadline, this article dropped. Bradley Cooper and Weston Middleton launch new production label set Hyperion at Warner Brothers with, with um, Graham King. Eight-time Oscar nominee Bradley Cooper is launching a new production banner with Weston Middleton, Deadline has earned, uh, learned. At the same time, the duo are set to produce Hyperion, based on the four-volume series of Dan Simmons' novels, a project which Cooper has long had in the works. Hyperion was uh, moves over from the Sci-Fi Channel to Warner Brothers. Um, hang on, I, I can't see this. I'm, 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 I'm getting. Um, there we go. The project which Cooper has long had in the works, Hyperion now moves over from Sci-Fi Channel to Warner Brothers. Motion Pictures with Oscar winner Graham King still attached to produce under his GK Films. Previously conceived as a limited series for Sci-Fi, Hyperion will now be adapted as a feature by Emmy-winning EP of HBO's Watchmen limited series, Tom Spazzelli? Uh, Zieli? I don't know his last, how do you pronounce that? A search for a director is underway. The change-up in adapting the IP as a movie instead of a limit, limited series is to provide the IP with more breadth and scope that the expansive story demands. I would think a series would be better for that, but okay. Published by Bantam Spectra, the Hyperion Canto series includes Hyperion from 89, Fall of Hyperion in 90, Endymion in 96, and Rise of Endymion in 97. The books are set 700 years after the death of Old Earth, where the galaxy is at war. Seven strangers set forth on a journey to unlock the mysteries of the planet Hyperion's time tombs, each convinced that they alone carry the key to saving humanity. Executive producer... Haley King will oversee the project on behalf of GK Films. Cooper previously had a six-year deal with Todd Phillips and Warner Brothers that recently concluded in 2019 with back-to-back -back commercial and critically acclaimed films. 
There was A Star is Born, nominated for eight Oscars, including Cooper for Best Picture, Adapted Screenplay, and Best Actor, which grossed over $436 million worldwide. And there was also Joker, which became the highest grossing R-rated movie ever, making $1.7 billion and notching 11 Oscar nominations, including Cooper for Best Picture and two wins for Joaquin Phoenix, Best Actor. And Hilder, oh, Goodman's daughter, it's, it's Goodman's daughter, uh, I can't. Uh, I can't pronounce that. Those Icelandic names. Best original score for uh, and Cooper and Middleton are currently determining the name of their new production label. Cooper was also Oscar nominated in 2015 Best Picture category and Best Actor for Clint Eastwood's highest grossing feature film, American Sniper, which made $547 million worldwide. In addition, he received a Best Actor nomination for 2013's Silver Linings Playbook and an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor for 2014's American Hustle. Phillips has been with Warner Brothers since 2005, beginning with Starsky and Hutch, though his $1.4 billion grossing the Hangover franchise, and he remains on the Burbank lot in California. Cooper has a first-look deal with Netflix, where he's making his new film, Maestro, currently in pre-production. He's repped by Range Media Partners. Now, does this mean that, I mean, who knows whether or not this is going to get made? They've announced it. They have a new deal at Warner Brothers. But I will say this. uh, For me, the fact that there's there's a pivot where, obviously, if you read... um, There's there's now a pivot to older IP, uh, literary-based IP, which makes me happy. And if you look at the box office prognostications, uh, there was a couple of interesting articles about movies that failed this weekend. Um, things like Edgar Wright's new movie, Last Night in Soho, a couple of other indie-themed films haven't been doing well. Venom crossing 400 million, Dune crossing almost crossing 300 million, um, No Time to Die crossing 600 million. Unfortunately for for a lot of us, we're not gonna the the box office is not changing anytime soon in terms of what kind of movies are getting released. Um, studios do what studios do best big, large-scale, spectacle-based entertainment. And um, I think that's okay. What I love about Hyperion is it is big, spectacle-based entertainment, but it's also thoughtful sci-fi. And if Warner Brothers commits to this, and I think that they should, I think that unlike with Dune, where we had to wait and wonder, I, I think that they should do... I, I mean, I can't I can't see... You can't, you can't make either Endymion or Hyperion um, as one movie. You, you, there's no possible way. You'll wind up with the Dark uh, dark Tower situation. Uh, if you're adapting a series of books, adapt a series of books. I mean, Warner Brothers, you had Lord of the Rings and you have Harry Potter. If that hasn't told you what you should know about adapting novels, I don't know what will. Of course, they've greenlit Dune, let's call it Dune Part 2. I hope they rechange it, uh, re, re, rejigger their ideas to making it Dune, Dune Prophet, and Dune Messiah. Uh, that's what I would love, and that means they would have to also... Um, do children of, I mean, uh, Dune Messiah, the second book, which even though, yes, people are like, well, you know, Rob, Paul Atreides is in Children of Dune. Yeah, he is. But the big story, his big story is sort of concluded in, in at least his journey from a cinematic standpoint. You could end at Dune Messiah and Paul Atreides' story would effectively have been told. Uh, at least I, I tend to think so. But yes, I know he's also in Dune Children of Dune, and then Duke Leto, or Leto the Second, becomes the God Emperor, which is all cool. But anyway, so uh, it's very exciting that they are adapting this kind of stuff. I'm very, very excited. Um, you know, I'm always saying that that uh, we live in wondrous times, and a lot of these things that I've always dreamed of seeing, it's coming to pass. And um, why we haven't got it yet, I think it's something to very much be looking forward to. And if you've never read, if you're looking to read some great sci-fi that is wildly entertaining, and yet it is hardcore sci-fi, Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion, do yourself a favor. And if I might throw out a, um, uh, 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 a what would I call a recommendation, there is a uh, YouTube channel, Quinn, Quinn's Ideas, Ideas of Ice and Fire, I think is the name of the YouTube channel, uh, Quinn's Ideas. That is a great, he's a great YouTuber, and he's gone into the Hyperion Cantos in great detail. He also is a Dune fanatic, 
So if you want to uh, learn more about the Dune universe, he's a great... I, I love his channel. I watch it all the time. And he really does deep dives into all of this stuff. And when you watch his channel, his enthusiasm for this material is infectious. And he really knows his shit. So Ideas of Ice and Fire, or it's Quinn's Ideas, I'm not really sure. Um, look it up. Go give him a subscribe. Watch uh, watch uh, his videos and get back to me. See what you uh, see what you what you think. But he goes into the Hyperion Cantos in great detail. And another thing, I just want to point out that uh, this week I'm I'm kind of having a, a, um, a, a, a an Eternals celebration week here. The Comic Doctor Kevin, the Comic Doctor, uh, is going to be coming on the show on Friday. And he is going to be giving away a slabbed 8, uh, 8.0, a slabbed 8.0 issue of Eternals 1 to celebrate the, and unlike me, he'll actually send it to you. <laughs> uh, so he's going to come on and talk about what, what does he do in terms of restoring comics. He also has a great YouTube channel, The Comics Doctor, so check it out. But yes, he will be giving away a slabbed, a slabbed uh, comic is... Obviously, it's a CGC comic that's vacuum-packed in a hard plastic, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, not a pouch, but, you know, like a, it's a hard plastic shell covering the comic and keeping it in great shape. But it's, you know, you can hang it on your wall. You can't open it up because then it's no longer slabbed anymore. But, you know, you can get the omnibus and read the actual comics, but then you'll have Eternals number one. And then I am also interviewing the costume designer for Eternals, and that will also be dropping on Friday on the Designing Hollywood podcast. So, uh, as everyone knows, I quite enjoyed the Eternals, and one of the things that I find interesting is that none of the real rev none of the reviews of the film have really talked about what I found so interesting about the movie, and I can't wait to really talk about. It, it has more to do with the cosmology of it all, um, but I I really enjoyed Eternals, uh, really enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. And we'll talk more about it when uh, you've all seen it, because I don't want to spoil it for anyone. So there you go. Um, let's see where I am. I got letters from people, and um, I'm going to start. I'm going I'm to read a few. Uh, hey, Rob, this one comes from Thomas Bennett. Hey, Rob, I have seldom been as furious as I am right now. If you're reading this on Rob's observations, I trust that I'm not being too preachy. And thanks in advance. The social media algorithms are designed to make us angry, and boy, are they doing their job today because I am seeing red. Uh, uh, I learned about the tragic death of Holly Hutchins Tuesday night like so many of us. Maybe it's because I've lost so many people in such a short period of time this year. My dad to cancer in April and three friends due to complications from COVID vaccines in September. But her sudden, unexpected, and unnecessary death was and remains a true shock to my system, and I'm not even familiar with her work. Something about our society is off kilter, because less than 12 hours later, I saw people on the right and left of the political spectrum arguing about whether or not Alec Baldwin should be charged with manslaughter and go to jail. People who had no idea of who Miss Hutchins was or what she meant to her friends and family were making cheap jokes about her death. Jokes many of them would never make if her husband and nine-year-old son were in the room. My, my heart grieves for her family and what they're going through. I also grieve for Alec Baldwin and the horror that he is dealing with. There have been news stories less than a day after her death saying that as far as safety goes, corners were cut to save money. If that is true, it'll come out in the investigation that is ongoing. Now there's a new wave of tweets comparing Alec Baldwin to Dick Cheney because Dick Cheney shot a friend when they were hunting one time. I am sick to death of this right versus left, red versus blue paradigm where facts don't matter. All that matters to the audience is who's involved in a tragedy and whether or not they agree with the audience's politics. Forgive my swearing, but that's fucking bullshit. A little boy no longer has his mother. There's an investigation that will figure out how it happened and who's to blame. And that's all that matters. And even if Alec Baldwin isn't charged with anything, he will have to live with the consequences of his part in this tragedy for the rest of his days. I don't know if that's punishment enough for the part he played in the tragic event, but I know it's not nothing. Life is a fragile thing. The world would be better if we would remember that more often and practice compassion for everyone we possibly can. 
I appreciate you, Rob. You're one of the few people on the internet I know will listen to any point of view. You give me hope that this world is not irredeemable. Thanks again for reading my letter and for all you do. Thomas. Well, uh, Thomas, I think that's a great uh, letter. I want to thank you for writing in. Look, I think that we, in terms of the political discourse in our country, uh, the us versus them mentality, whether you're on the right or whether you're on the left, I think we're really starting to lose the plot in terms of where we're at. We're Americans first and foremost. And then, of course, I think even above that, we're human beings. And our country is tearing itself apart over this kind of partisan politics. I mean, do you really hate your neighbor that much? Do you really hate people that disagree with you politically? It's getting to the point where I think our country has forgotten just basic respect for human beings, for one another. We've become so jaded and so cynical, and our meme culture, our meme world has gotten to the point where you know, it's so easy to tear each other down that we've forgotten that once we used to hold each other up. And always, I understand, there's, I'm not pining away for a, a time of when, when it was all hunky-dory, because it never was. I mean, you go back into the uh, 1800s and you can see very divisive political cartoons of the day. And you can see that people were yelling and screaming at each other. That hasn't changed. But the thing was, I think that nowadays, um, you know... <laughs> We can even watch uh, Merrick Garland was being questioned by Ted Cruz the other day. And the, the, the lack of respect that Ted Cruz showed Merrick Garland, I'm no Ted Cruz fan and I don't know much, much about Merrick Garland, but we have two men that are supposedly in the service of our country. And that alone should be worthy of respect, at least for one another. And the lack of respect Merrick Garland was given by Ted Cruz, and it wasn't, it wasn't about, um, I didn't think it was about partisan politics. I mean, it certainly was from his perspective, but I just found the whole thing distasteful that you would treat somebody like Ted Cruz would treat Merrick Garland the way he was being treated. I mean, you know, when you're doing something, you would, you would, I would assume that, that we all should uh, at least give people a level of respect for what has been achieved. If somebody has done a lot of work and they've put a lot of time in or a lifetime in learning their craft or honing their abilities, that alone is worthy of respect. And I think, you know, whether you agree with somebody politically or not, have we forgotten how to talk to one another or not even talk to one another, but at least be mindful or respectful of people's abilities and the time that they've put into doing something? Um, and I think that's really problematic. And, and what's happening is if you, you start to dehumanize and disrespect your fellow man, that's, we saw, what, we saw what happened, I mean, being a, a Jew myself, they did that. The Nazis did that to the Jews, to all European Jewry. But in Germany, they started, uh, they dehumanized the Jews systematically. And then when people start seeing other groups of people as less than human, well, then it makes it a lot easier to put a bullet in their face or ship them off to industrialized extermination centers. We've seen it throughout the 20th century, and we're seeing that kind of thing happen now. And it's something I think we need to be very mindful of. Um, I wish it was a default position that people respected one another. But this was a tragedy, as you pointed out, Thomas. And it is not a laughing matter. And the fact that within days uh, we have people turning it into a meme or making fun of what, what happened. And we had many people's lives are lost. Uh, and, and that we turn it into a joke. Any, any loss of life, especially this situation tragic, accidental, shouldn't have happened. Um, it's bad. Uh, it's bad. Uh, Omar writes in and says, Hi, Rob, moderators in the Post Geek Singularity. Since we are now seeing a lot of reviews for Eternals coming out, I looked at them and noticed something a number of them are saying. A common thing I have been reading in most reviews is how different it is from other MCU movies. This is something I know some moviegoers don't like when it comes to franchises, where they don't really like a certain movie or movies in a franchise because they're all so different from previous movies. I've always had mixed feelings on this. On one hand, I do prefer consistency with franchises since I take issues with movies being so different from one another. For example, the Lethal Weapon movies are like that, where it became very inconsistent as it went on, because the first movie was pretty serious, but each film afterwards became more lighthearted and comedic. 
On the other hand, I also don't have a problem with something being different as long as it's good. To bring Lethal Weapon back up again as an example, this was also the case. Even though I thought there was a little too much comedy in it, I really did like Lethal Weapon 2, finding it better than the original and the best in the series. Another example is the Star Wars prequel trilogy. Certain people who didn't like the movies said they disliked them because they were too different from the original trilogy. When I saw them, even though I didn't like them, I didn't really care if they were different from the original trilogy, I just cared if they were good. However, some people then complained about how Force Awakens was too similar to A New Hope and not something different. I will admit, while I thought it was a derivative of A New Hope and would rather have seen something different, I actually liked Force Awakens when I saw it. That was something I noticed with moviegoers when it comes to movies in a franchise being different from what came before. In my case, when it comes to Eternals, I only care if I find the movie good, even if it is very different from previous MCU movies. Thanks, and live long and prosper. Omar94. Well, you know, Omar, I mean, I think... I think what what the thing about franchise movies is usually they're telling a continuation of a story. And when they tend to uh, be really different from other one another, it seems a little incongruous. I mean, I remember when Road Warrior came out, well, it was released in America in 82, and then Beyond Thunderdome came out in 85, a lot of people criticized Beyond Thunderdome because... It, it, whereas Road Warrior was sort of stripped down and pretty straightforward, Beyond Thunderdome had a lot more, let's call it, plot, a lot more world building, and it didn't have the apocalypse pow action of Road Warrior. But I think, interestingly enough, Beyond Thunderdome has aged well, I think, um, and I think those things that were once seen as drawbacks have made the film last longer than it might have otherwise. And I really like, you know, Fury Road is more along the lines of Road Warrior, but I do think, look, to me, um, I think a lot of the time the franchise films just aren't that good, you know, and and when you have a a great movie, like, look, I love Die Hard. I think we all love Die Hard. Die Hard is a template for what a great studio action uh, action figure, action movie should be. Um, It's sprawling, it's character driven, it's got great plot. A great plot, great Jeopardy, but most importantly, great characters. And then uh, it's beautifully made, beautifully directed, beautifully shot by Jan de Bont, beautifully directed by John McTiernan. Everything about Die Hard is it, the 65 millimeter visual effects done by Richard Edlund. Uh, amazing. The whole thing is amazing. And then when we got Die Hard 2, it was sort of more of the same, but uh, it seemed like it was the the frat boy younger brother of the original Die Hard, if that makes any sense. And it was kind of a throwback and a rehash, and it wasn't as slick and polished as the original Die Hard. I mean, Rennie Harlan was not the director John McTiernan was. Dieter, I apologize if you're watching this, but Rennie Harlan, I know you love him, but he's not the director John McTiernan is. I'm just saying. So, um, yeah. and I, I, But I understand your point. I, I think that... We want our franchises to have consistency in them. That's why we love them so much. And I think what's most important is, are the characters and situations consistent with one another? You can change things up. But, you know, I think that's one of the reasons people don't like The Last Jedi. Uh, I think the tone and the consistency, especially if you're following up uh, The Force Awakens, it turns into a different kind of film. And while I enjoyed where Luke went, I thought the movie was fairly kind of all over the place in terms of tone, and I can understand why people didn't like it. But, um, you know, I think that kind of thing is uh, important. Um, yeah. This next one comes from Rhett Proctor. Hello, Rob, and everyone in the Post Geek Singularity. Buckle up, this might be a long one. Uh, I've been a Marvel fan ever since I watched Spider Man in the 90s cartoon and the X Men cartoons. I love everything Marvel. And I've seen every single MCU movie at least five times. But out of every hero, my favorite is and always will be Spider-Man. And I'm very excited for No Way Home. When I first saw the trailer, I nearly jumped out of my seat when I saw Green Goblin's pumpkin bomb. Then we see Doc Ock's arm. Oh, yes, I am so in. I am hoping Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire are in the movie. Although I hear Kevin Feige saying don't be disappointed if they're not. Are in the movie. And I hope we get the live-action Spider-Verse. Well... We should, since their villains are appearing in the movie, and now with Venom in the MCU, the future looks bright. Thanks, Rob, and have a great day. Hey, you know what? Um, I'm telling you, I'm very excited about Spider-Man No Way Home. I can't 
I, uh, I, I, you know, it seems strange to me that they're doing all of this and that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't get Spider-Man. We wouldn't get the other Spider-Man, but I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I can't, I can't, um, I can't, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I, I'm, I've enjoyed the Spider-Man movies. I've enjoyed all of them except with really the exception of the second Amazing Spider-Man, the Andrew Garfield movie, I thought was all over the place. It was just kind of a mess. Um, so, yeah. And um, all good. All good. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me... Let's see. I think that... Um, see what we got here this one comes from alex detman alex detman rob a few months ago you read a message i'd sent into the john campia show about how you guys make my day better and with my job at the hospital here in chicago and how i had to make my 400 or 41st death notification due to COVID. that day it was just you on the companion video and how you spoke to me after reading that horrible day i had I felt not so alone anymore. To be honest, I've actually read this letter before, but I'll read it again. To be honest, I love John, and I think he's awesome. But his greatest choice of being independent was by selecting you as his co-host. You told me that I wasn't alone, and I belonged to our community. So today I'm proud to say thank you for accepting me in this awesome Geek Singularity community that you've created. So with that said, thank you for being kind, genuine, caring, funny, and hilariously fun to watch, especially when you're drinking. <laughs> So with all the mushy shit out of the way, I wanted to tell you, like you, I'm somewhat of a collector myself, and I've been for years, but in no way on your level, in regard to figure collection. I actually customize and collect the old school school three and three quarter inch G.I. Joe figures, and then transform them to some of my favorite characters, ranging from John Barenthal's Punisher, this is cool, Predator, variants of Hugh Jackman's Logan, all the way to Batman and even Josh Brolin's Cable. Ever since I was a kid, I love movies. So my cousin and I would make our own characters from our favorite movies and make our own better versions of those favorite movies, at least to us. <laughs> from Dust Till Dawn to Jurassic Park, all the way to Con Air and Bad Boys. And since then, creating new characters from our favorite movies is still a hobby for us. In the end, I know this hasn't been the most intellectual or best written letter, but I heard, uh, I heard, but I promise I'll send you some more soon and that we'll have much more interesting content, especially about how Star Trek is declined so poorly that even the final frontier makes Star Trek better than Trek today. But this letter was to tell you that you have an influence in people's lives every day, and I'm one of them, and I just wanted to thank you, and maybe one of these days hop on the show with you and shoot the shit if you would like. Alex Detman. P.S. I was on the Chargers practice squad back in 06, and I still have some connections, so if you ever want to see your Seahawks play the Chargers, you just let me know. Well, I will. And that, what a nice letter. Thank you for the kind words. You know, I appreciate it. I think the best thing this YouTube channel has going is our community. Like I've always said, you know, I just throw the party. I throw open the doors. It's all of you who are here in the chat or you come talk about these things. It's you who make this channel what it is, not me. Um, so thanks for the kind words. I appreciate it. I might take you up on that uh, Chargers, Chargers idea. Uh, this next letter comes from Mr. Goof People himself, Tom Jr. Jackson. Hi, Rob. Today I wanted to write in about something outside the box. And why not? It's fun, and we never know where it will take us. So today I decided just to put on some music and relax. And today I listened to the Super Deluxe Let It Be album. And then a giant playlist of solo stuff that I made from Paul McCartney's catalog. And what blew my mind is how far in the past 50 years the music of Paul McCartney has come. And that let me down, let me down a rabbit hole of analyzing it. Here's a guy who started out in music almost 60-something years ago and can't read or write music. Well, write it in the classical sense. He is someone who didn't take piano, drum, guitar, or bass lessons. He self-taught himself to play the piano, and that in itself is amazing. I mean, sure, when he was a kid, and we'd hear about some guy that a new chord that he didn't know, he would take a few buses across town and visit the guy and learn those chords. Now, I know this may seem nerdy or not really cool, but to me, I just listened to the music. I mean, really listened. And what I found was someone that absolutely loves music, and not just listening to it, but making it and creating it as well. I mean, here is a guy who basically was in one of the biggest bands in the world. And that really wasn't the goal, but he made it there anyway, 
and then the band breaks up and he doesn't know what to do. So he just decides, decides to start fresh from the beginning and start a whole new band, which becomes even more successful than the Beatles. And then you have his solo accomplishments as well. Classical music, uh, such as oratorios and orchestral stuff, experimental music, writing books of poetry and also a children's book, and then currently writing a musical based on It's a Wonderful Life. Why am I writing this? Well, because Paul McCartney is an imagination connoisseur. His passion to make and create music and books and things that will create not only the soundtrack of billions and millions of lives, but serves also as an inspiration. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It's not about what you do or how you do it, but it's about the passion that you put into it. If you put the passion in whatever you are into, then you can accomplish whatever we want and still be goof people as well. Which to me shows how much passion you put into the things that you do as well. We are not put into this world to impress anyone but ourselves. We must always be trying to top the best thing we've done and to do something better and just have fun doing it as well. Well, I know this seems like I'm rambling, but this was an impromptu letter that I needed to write because I was inspired by the moment. Oh, and to answer your question, the new remixed Let It Be album, excellent. So, until my next letter, Tom Jr. Jackson, Emeritus de Goof. <laughs> uh, Tom, you know, you're one of the foundational members of this community. Always good to hear from you. Look, I agree, man. You look at somebody like uh, Paul McCartney, somebody who's not rested on his laurels and he's still creating stuff. I mean, that's um, that's what it's all about, man. I mean, what, what else are we here for if not then to celebrate our, our achievements and the achievements of others? Uh, and, you know, art is really what separates and, and these kinds of endeavors is what separates us from the rest of, of mankind or the rest of mankind. Pardon me, the rest of the animal world, the rest of animal kind. Um, and, you know, that's what I try and uh, choose to focus on is, is the work. I mean, obviously, I'm surrounded by I'm a fan of other people's work. I try and do my own work as well. And, and I'm inspired by everything else I love, like the books of Dan Simmons. You know, and I think that's what that's what makes life worth living is is seeing I love the artistic endeavors of, of all kinds of people, whether it's arts and crafts at a local fair or whether you're reading a classic novel written in like Oliver Twist or something or you're watching a film from the 1940s whether it's Double Indemnity or or something like Casablanca something like that um you know it's it's I I am inundated with the uh, with human endeavor I'm I'm constantly amazed by it and talk talk, uh, Paul McCartney is definitely a credit to all of us I mean the Beatles are one of the most influential musical groups in all of human history and he didn't stop and go well I can't do that again no, man, he composed a theme to a James Bond movie. And um, he's 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 got no sign of stopping. And it's amazing. And I agree with you. I mean, that's the way to live your life. Um, he's not retiring. Why? He'll probably be making music up till the day he leaves us. And I think um, uh, I think that uh, you're absolutely right about that. And, I th- you know, I love that. I love that you were inspired to write a letter because you're listening. You're going down the rabbit hole, hole of Paul McCartney and, you know, you were so taken with it that you wrote me a letter to celebrate his work and celebrate us, the Post Geek Singularity community. So good on you, sir. You're a good man, Charlie Brown, Tom Jr. Jackson. And yes, we are all goof people. And if you want to be the, be the emeritus, the goof, somebody should make a, I'll, I'll put that t-shirt up. And the, if there's a picture of you that says emeritus, the goof, I'll put it in the merch store. Uh, we do have a merch store, by the way, if you want. You can just look below on YouTube and <laughs> find sweatshirts. Uh, This next letter comes from Derwood76. Good morning, Robert, and the glorious post-geek singularity community. My introduction to the Dune universe by Frank Herbert was quite singular. My dad was an ardent reader of westerns, fantasy, and science fiction. While perusing his bookshelf, I found Frank Herbert's Chapter House Dune at age 12. That was the final book of the six he wrote. I read it quite quickly, but was understandably confused. (laughs) Not having read the previous five books or seeing the David Lynch film, it took me a week to finish, which was quite a while for me. I greatly enjoyed the encyclopedia entries and also enjoyed the Gola Miles Tags Awakening, for obvious reasons. Uh, a later, A year later, I was able to get a monthly bus pass on the Broward County Transit, and the first book I read at the library was Dune. It was odd, as I seemed to know the framework of the story, but the individual pieces and plot lines kept snapping into place and surprising me. I kept anticipating scenes recounted by a trade or an encyclopedia entry and was blown away by the visceral emotions of the actual scenes in the book. 
I adored the omniscient third-person narrator, which introduced exposition so readily by switching the narrator's point of view with every paragraph. In only three pages, the point of view of the narrator jumped between Paul, Jessica, and Gaius Helen Mohayim 20, years in, <laughs> 20 times in those brief pages as the Gom Jabbar test was administered by the Reverend Mother. I asked myself, why didn't more novelists use this device? <laughs> I didn't have a library card, as my brother still had a book he'd checked out six years earlier. He returned it in 2000 and had to pay a $240 fine for how to draw dinosaurs. <laughs> so I took the 75 bus from Western Davie, Florida, to the West Regional Library in Plantation, and I would read from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. and would read amazing books that summer. I loved Dune, Dune Messiah, and Children of Dune, but God Emperor of Dune blew my mind as a young Christian true believer in Christ and his kingdom. It wasn't until my second week of bus travel that I sat down and devoured God Emperor and integrated the concepts into my head, reconciling my putative understanding of the Eucharist with the fish speaker's holy rites. I again had my mind blown. <laughs> I happened to catch David Lynch's Dune in October of that year on WBFS TV 33 in Fort Lauderdale, and I recognized it for the flawed adaptation it was, but I also knew it was a masterpiece for me. Uh, I'm sorry I rambled, but I see myself as a literary science fiction fan first. Good man. Since the works I enjoyed most weren't science fiction films, but were science fiction novels. The Naked City, Robots of Dawn, I, Robot, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, they were far better than the cheesy state of -of state-of-the-art sci-fi of the 1980s films. Live long and prosper, Mr. Burnett. Uh, Durwood. Uh, So that's cool. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I love hearing that story. I love that you rode the bus and that you read from 9 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night. I mean, that's a that's an eight-hour day well spent with a lunch break inside or in the middle of it. I think that's amazing. Um, fantastic. I mean, that's a great, great story. You know, God Emperor might be my favorite book in the series of Frank Herbert's six books. Just because it's, you know, it's, it's so cool. Uh, this one comes from Mark Erickson. Uh, congratulations on your success with Tango Shalom. I have a phys- I have physical media on pre-order as it didn't quite make it into theaters in Iowa. I can't believe, by the way, it's still, Tango Shalom is still in theaters, and it made, for our little movie that's playing at a few theaters, it made 900 bucks. It made over, like, $1,400 this week, this weekend, <laughs> which seems like nothing compared to what Hollywood movies make. But for us, our goal uh, for Tango Shalom was only to make $100,000 in our theatrical run, and we, we, we did that, and that was, I, I was dubious, because, you know, a movie that has no advertising, you're putting in two theaters here, or three theaters there, to make $100,000, I know it seems not, not like much, but for our movie, um, a movie that shouldn't really have ever been in the theaters, it was really good for us, and it's still making money, so crazy, and now, of course, you can get it everywhere on VOD. Mark Erickson writes in and says, hi, Rob, congratulations on your success with Tango Shalom, I have physical media on pre-order, as it didn't quite make it into theaters in Iowa. Do you consider Star Trek, the animated series, as canonical? I tend to say yes, simply because Gene Roddenberry let his name be put on it, and he cashed the check from Paramount. In addition, I believe several of the scripts were actually written for TOS, had there been a season four. Best of luck in all of your future endeavors, Mark. Well, a lot of people ask me this. I do consider the Star Trek, the animated series, canonical. And not only that, but Alan Dean Foster... The great Alan Dean Foster actually novelized all 22 episodes of the animated series in his Star Trek log books. There was 10 of them. And um, as he went on, some of those he expanded into full novels. And having read all those books, uh, they really made those shows come alive. Uh, And I absolutely think the animated series is canonical. And I obviously, I mean, I've never... I know that um, uh, I know that a lot of people, and even Roddenberry himself, said the animated series is not canonical. But and there's a lot of goofy things in there. Like I, but I think it's cool. There's an Aqua Shuttle, but I I like a lot of those stories. I mean, yesteryear they think of as canonical, and why not? I really like the Counterclock incident. You know, I remember seeing the first episode. I think the first episode broadcast was Beyond the Furthest Star. That was, if memory serves, it was written by Samuel Peoples, right? who also, of course, wrote for the original series. So I, I consider the animated series canonical, you know, um, even if some people uh, don't. Um, so there you go. 
And this is a really, this next letter is a very weird uh, letter, but I'm going to read it anyway. It is from Fox Pixar Media. And this guy, this actually guy sent us some links to some totally random claymation videos with Darkwing Duck and etc. cetera. Um, but I'm going to read it anyway. So Fox Pixar Media starts out and says, hey, I got a plenty of questions I got for you. One, have you ever watched Chucklewood Critters? Uh, I have not. Number two, do you think Synergy, the company behind Die Hard 3, will return? Don't think so. (laughs) Three, is Darkwing Duck Prison Break an epic remake of the first three issues of the 2016 comic? I don't know. I don't know. The Warner Brothers 2021 logo came out and had a fanfare by Ludwig. What do you think of it? I like it. A lot of people have not liked the new Warner Brothers logo. I like that it starts, you see the water tower, and of course they change the color of the shield, but I like it. Um, yeah, I think it's good. Um, five, do you think Paramount would do an Airplane 3? If so, what would the poster art be like? <laughs> uh, that's hard to say. I don't know if they would ever do an Airplane 3. Although it would be kind of funny if they did, but I don't know if I'd want anyone besides Zucker, Abrams, and Zucker to do it. Uh, six, have you ever watched the following films? Danger Mouse, The Last Mouse Standing, The Ant and the Aardvark, Krogzilla, The Godfather 2001, also known as The Godfather, The N-Bomb Edition, Boom and Topper, Safe Safari Hunters, Legendary's Toy Story 2015, Darkwing Duck, Prison Break, and the 1996 classic with a belt strapping to a pipe ending known as Twister, which is getting an actual remake from Universal. Well, I did see Twister. Uh, what did the DVD menu animation of the Don't Call Me Shirley edition look like, and what was the record scratch used for? Uh, I don't know. I don't believe I have the DVD menu, and I don't believe I have the DVD of the DVD of the Don't Call Me Shirley edition. Eight was the airplane poster art originally a straight plane or a tied up one? Because there's a lot of versions made for it, even a f- flying high one. Flying high is the alternate title used for the Australian and UK release. Uh, I don't know. (laughs) Nine, have you ever watched Dinosaurs on Honolulu? It's this series on Fox Pixar Media that is about to end its original iteration next year so that the film, Into the Badlines, and the reboot series, The Adventures of Dinosaurs on Honolulu, would be beginning of a new iteration. Um, I I haven't. (laughs) Uh, have you checked number 10 have you checked the polish posters made for airplane and airplane 2 the sequel if you have what do they look like i i have not <laughs> i do have a polish poster for to live and die in la uh hanging in my bedroom and i did give brian singer an original polish star wars movie poster for his birthday one year mm. 11 how do you interpret the belt strapping to a pipe ending of twister if so, what's going on with Bill Paxton's shirt why, the, why they are inside of the F5? Speaking of which, is the black tank top still on his body? Uh, you know, I I need to go back and <laughs> watch Twister. It's been a while, but it's coming out on 4K. 12, what do you think of the new MGM logo? It looks tragic. Uh, it's all right, you know. Uh, 13, M- Airplane is going to be on TVNZ Duke this Friday. What do I do? Well, I think you should probably have watched it. 14, what was the original Canadian channel that aired uh, YCD TOV TV? Hint, it's not Nickelodeon. I, I I don't know. I never lived in Canada. 15, what film should be in the Megascope aspect ratio since Boom and Topper Safari Hunters is the first to use the Megascope aspect ratio? Well, I, I guess Boom and Topper Safari Hunters should be used. In the mega aspect ratio. Have you ever checked the Fox Pixar media logo? Uh, I don't know. Uh, 17. A Bug's Life is Pixar's very first film. Really? What is Disney's first CG animated film? Hint, it's the first one in 10 years since Disney's Toy Story. Their first CG animated movie. Huh. I don't know. Um, 18. Who threw the airplane script in the trash? Uh, oh, you know what? I actually know this. Um, um, was it, was it Robert Stack? That might be wrong. 19. Do you think Abner and George would be the main characters instead of Buttons and Rusty? Uh, I don't know. And, um, and number 20. 
Do you think Darkwing Duck Prison Break could be recut into a shorter runtime? Because I think it should not. I think the 219-minute runtime is iconic, and the Queen soundtrack, with the exception of the En Vogue track that opened the film alongside the variant of the Amblin logo, is iconic as well. Also, the film really rips off Airplane right down to the poster art being referenced. Do you think it should be recut? Because I think it should be the 219 animated, 219 minute animated epic that we all know and cravingly loved. I'm not mad, but my chainsaw, on the other hand, is mad. Would always be the most iconic line ever put, put to the screen, beating I am serious and don't call me Shirley to ultimate violating shame since Darkwing Duck Prison Break is literally copying Airplane. In its almost hour-long second act in the middle with Elmer Bernstein's airplane score taking over from Mark Mancina's Twister score as opposed to John Powell and Henry Gregson Williams' Chicken Run score in the entirety of the would-be synergy classic The Ant and the Aardvark, which featured a rival com- uh, competition between an ant and aardvark until a demigod-like devil literally turns them around, turning them good for a brief ten minutes before turning them back into rivals. This time it's even worse and more worser than the epic never-ending rivalry in Disney's Toy Story from 1995 and Legendary's Toy Story from 2015, but more powerful and devastating with the ant's powerful final words to the aardvark before the Tay Zonday track played just a second after being the most powerful and devastating line in what would be an instant classic, and several references to the original film, such as the forklift glass break scene that was shown in the original teaser and the theatrical trailer for the film, the No More Cheese line, the poster art reference, the film's title being wrecked, damaged, and or destroyed, the quit smoking line with the smoking coming after it, and the fact that audio clips from the film, as well as the deleted cornfield scene in the 1982 sequel being played, but do you think it should be recut to a shorter runtime? That's all I have to say. Keep going. I think reading this letter, sir, I feel like I smoked some some really, really dank nugs. But I want to uh, thank you for writing in. Um, I don't quite know what it all means, to be honest. But, you know, I'm willing to continue to try and understand. Guess what I have? I have a letter from Willow Yang that I haven't read, and it's not about Star Trek. It's not about Star Trek. I know you're wondering what it is about. What is Willow's letter about today? Well, I'm going to read it to you and tell you, because you'll know. Take it away, Willow. Greetings, Rob. I am writing to give my thoughts on the HBO series Warrior. For those who have not heard of the show, the story, which was initially conceptualized decades ago by Bruce Lee, follows the character of Assam, a Chinese migrant and expert martial artist who travels to San Francisco in search of his lost sister. He joins one of the more powerful Tong gangs there and befriends the son of the gang leader, only to soon discover that his sister had married the aging leader of a rival gang and has schemes of her own. He also meets a brothel madam who is living a secret double life as a Tao-wielding vigilante, exacting bloody vengeance on those who are terrorizing the Chinese migrants. Meanwhile, there is trouble brewing with the Irish workers angry at the Chinese for taking away their jobs and the politicians finding ways of using racial tensions for their own political gains. Having finished the first two seasons, the third season supposedly coming out in 2023, I have to say that I'm quite impressed by Warrior. If I had to nitpick, the one element that, I, that did take me out of the show for a bit for the first few episodes is the casting of Andrew Koji, a Japanese-English actor, actor as the lead. In general, I don't care all that much about having an Asian actor from one country playing an Asian character from a different country. While my parents are very good at being able to distinguish between Asians, I hardly ever take notice. In this one particular instance, however, I do think that Andrew Koji doesn't really look Chinese, so much so that it actually became slightly distracting. Having said that, I do think he's very good in the role, both in the dramatic parts as well as the action. And according to Louis Yu, who is also watching the series, his Cantonese is actually quite good. And after a couple of episodes, I was able to get over his appearance. As an aside, I really like the Hunt for Red October trick that Warner Brothers used, that, oh, that Warner Brothers, that Warrior used, where the Chinese characters are speaking Cantonese most of the time, but what the audience hears is English. And when the characters are actually speaking English, it is heavily accented and broken. The only exception being Assam and his sister, who are fluent English speakers in the story. It's a clever way of maintaining realism while not alienating the audience by having subtitles for most of the series. The biggest strength of Warrior to me is the pacing, particularly in the first season. I was drawn into the story from the first scene, and there was never a time when I felt that the show was just dragging. 
there's so much intrigue and tension, and apart from a few of the main characters, it really feels that anyone can die at any moment. The characters are complex and morally ambiguous, each with their own secrets and schemes. The action and fight choreography is exciting and fun to watch, but also incredibly visceral. To use your favorite word, the fights have verisimilitude. Nobody is invincible, and even the best fighters on the show take heavy damage and get bloodied and broken. And of course, being a Cinemax HBO series, there is a good amount of sex and nudity, although that does get noticeably toned down in the second season. In addition to the intrigue and excellent action sequences, Warrior is also filled with social commentary. I have to admit, in spite of being a Chinese immigrant, a lot of what I'm seeing on the show is completely foreign to me. The Chinese that is spoken is Cantonese, and being a Shanghaiese Mandarin speaker myself, I'm unfamiliar with the slangs and curses they used. According to Lewis, however, the Cantonese on the show is authentic and similar to what he spoke in his youth, although that might not necessarily be reflective of the dialect in the 1800s. I don't know anything about the Tongs. Moreover, I'm quite taken aback by how the Chinese were treated in America back in the day. I came to Canada in 1999, grew up in a neighborhood in Vancouver where Asians make up the vast majority of the population, and never personally experienced any instance of discrimination. The Chinese are now considered to be a model minority, stereotyped as being good at math and overrepresented in colleges. It is hence initially shocking for me to see the racial vitriol that the Chinese migrants faced back in the day, seeing them treated like animals, being called intellectually inferior and dirty, carriers of diseases, getting beaten and lynched whenever they ventured out of Chinatown. The show served as a rude reminder to me of how times have changed. It wasn't until the late 20th century, after an influx of wealthier, more highly educated immigrants from places like Hong Kong, that attitudes toward the Chinese improved. Before then, they were treated just like every other poor minority group. Warrior's depiction of the racial tension between the Chinese and the white populace, in particular the Irish, is both a historical reality and also a minor image of the issues that we're witnessing today. As is the case now, it is difficult to discern how much of the Irish's hatred toward the Chinese is due to economic woes and how much of it is due to just plain old racism. What is clear, however, is that their grievances, while legitimate, are very much, very much misguided. It is not the poor Chinese migrants whom they should be angry at, but the businessmen who don't want to pay fair wages. It seems to me that, in the show, those who are supposedly on the right side of the law are arguably more terrible than those that are on the wrong side. Sure, the Tongs are violent criminals that are consistently fighting and killing each other, constantly fighting and killing each other. However, the Irish mob, led by the racist unionist Leary, is arguably even worse as they have the advantage of the system in the country being on their side. The police are mostly corrupt, but worst of all are the people in charge, the politicians who see everyone as being nothing but pawns in their game, mechanisms to advance their own ambitions. There's Blake, the slimy mayor, who is basically a representation of the establishment politicians, a man who stands for nothing, believes in nothing other than winning his re-election, carefully treading a tightrope of appealing to the hatred and xenophobia of the Irish laborers, whilst not alienating his business allies that are relying on cheap Chinese labor, and who also enjoy frequenting Chinese brothels to get pegged. Not that there's anything wrong with that, as we discussed on one of our Midnight Medals. And then there's Crestwood, a senator who represents the populists, capitalizing on the violence and chaos in the city to help with his presidential bid, rallying the Irish workers with chance of send them back. The bitter irony, as a character attending one of Crestwood Rally's notes, is of course the poor blue-collared workers are cheering on a privileged millionaire, believing him to be their champion when in fact it is people like him and not the Chinese migrants that are the real cause of their misery. And sure, I do believe that the show has likely taken inspiration from the current political climate. However, the Chinese Exclusion Act did happen, both in America and Canada, and would, it would appear that history has a habit of repeating itself. All in all, I really loved Warrior. The show stands very well on its own as just a martial arts crime drama filled with tension, fantastic action sequences, and complicated, morally ambiguous characters. However, it also manages to discuss historical and social issues that are strongly applicable today. I hope that more people will watch the series, and I look forward to the third season when it finally comes out. Best regards, Willow Yang. Well, Willow, what a great... Uh, you know, I have to say, uh, your writing is terrific. And, um, you know, you maybe you should, instead of writing me letters, uh, find an outlet uh, that will pay you. Because I think the fact that you're a PhD, now you're a doctor, you're Chinese, and you're, you're a woman um, can help you probably get a good job somewhere writing because you're, you're a tremendous writer. And your reviews are, are really well thought out, uh, 
beautifully written, and I think they have a lot to offer. And you should be writing for an outlet that's paying you for these things. But until then, I'm happy to take your work because it's fantastic. And for those of you who want to read more of Willow's letters, you can go find them on the burnettwork.net website under Willow Talk. I do cherish your work, Willow, but man, you should be getting paid for this shit because you're good at it. And I really like your takes. I mean, you and I are, um, we park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. So I want to uh, thank you for writing in, Willow. Uh, you, my dear, are, uh, you're a prized human being and one of my favorite people here on the, well, at the Post Geek Singularity. So thanks for that. And speaking of Willow, she also has written in and sent in a tip as she is wont to do. So let's jump over to see what you guys are saying. Uh, hold on a minute here. Uh, bring up Will Willow. So Willow says, So I've heard you've got a new top secret animation project. Having worked on both live action and animation projects, which field do you enjoy working on more? Well, it's not so much top secret. I mean, I'm ta I just don't... I don't like to talk about the projects that I'm working on until they're further along, until they've manifested themselves. Like, I'm a person that believes that you should only put things on the IMDb after they've been shot, because after they've been shot, they've been shot already. You know, I've been burned with having projects that go on the IMDb that, that don't get made, but we talk about them, they get listed on the IMDb, and it's hard to get them off. But I think that, um, yeah, so I've been working on a project, um, I've formed a new entertainment company with Mike Bodden. Our company is actually called Imagination Connoisseurs Unlimited, and uh, we got we got a bunch of stuff going on. We um, are are we're working on an animated project and a number of films, low budget horror films in the three million and less dollar range. So there's a lot of interesting stuff percolating. I'm also working on a new film with Gabe Bologna that um, I'm doing some editorial work on. Uh, that's based on a South African's playwright, a uh, South African playwright's play, African Gothic, and um, it's. Uh, well, you'll 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 hear more about that later, but um, yeah, but again, I don't. I you know I don't like to. Um, I don't like to to talk about that much. I don't like to talk about things until they're further along. But yes, this animated project is really exciting, and we're doing work on it now, we're, as we speak. Well, not at at this. Particular, well, there's other people doing work on it, but I am not, but I will be doing more work on it later. Our man Julius Goodwin is here. Julius, that's a very generous tip you've sent in. Julius is, of course, the channel's official uh, sommelier of, um, uh, he, I'm the sommelier of cinema, <laughs> but um, uh, Julius Goodwin is the sommelier of the channel. Julius says, I just wanted to drop in and see how you were. I admit the minute I heard Hyperion, I admittedly thought of the Marvel Comics character by that name. Yes, uh, I thought it'd be a little early for such an obscure character, but we did just get Eternal. So, hey, nope, Hyperion is, again, uh, I just like showing this book because, you know, I mean, this thing, this is what I like. I like cherry, you know, I don't like any kind of, you know, man, this is still in great shape. Can't believe this book's 32 years old, but there you go. I need to read this again. I need to read all four of these again. Um, I can't believe it's been like since I read Rise of Endymion. What was that? They say 97? Yeesh. I'm getting old. Um, yeah, so it's not Hyperion, the Marvel Comics character. <laughs> Although, that's, he's, he's Squadron Supreme, right? Um, so, yeah, that's pretty neat. I can't wait. Uh, Chloe Fanning says, imagine climbing Annapurna or K2. Woo. Now, imagine climbing all of the 14 highest peaks in the world in just six months. Unreal, right? Considering the weather and time for your body to heal from that elevation, I'm amazed that they've done it. 14 Peaks is on Netflix. Chloe, I did not know that. Is that true? Um, man, that's something I totally would watch. How dope is that? I mean, that's, that's really, really cool. Uh, Lance Bergson says, the new Morbius trailer drops tomorrow. I'm very excited for this movie as it's one of my personal favorite Marvel characters. Did you see the short featurette that was released today? I did. And, you know, they've got, uh, was it a truck or was it a, a, a city bus that disappears? It's interesting that in Morbius and in uh, Eternals, you we get to see city buses or trucks disappear. Um, but, yeah, I love Morbius. Morbius the living vampire. I'm very excited to see that. I um, I can't wait. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of uh, Jared Leto. I mean, I've been a fan of his 
look, I've said one of the great unsung science fiction movies of all time is um, Mr. Nobody. Fantastic film. Uh, Stubble McShave says, I loved Hyperion. When reading a book, you are a co-creator by taking on the role of a director for your own theater of the mind. You know what? I've always thought that, but I've never quite heard it articulated. But you're absolutely right, Stubble. When you read a book, you're a co-creator and you're becoming the director. It will be interesting to see how they reimagine Hyperion for a new format. Don't know how they'll fit the story into a movie. I don't think they can, to be honest. Um, I don't think it's possible to fit uh, all of Hyperion into one movie. I, I, it's just, I don't think it can be done. But it'll be interesting to see what they do, what they try, how they try and make it work. Uh, Kevin sends in a super chat and says, Rob, what's your interpretation of American Psycho? Was it all in Patrick Bateman's head? Or was he a killer, just maybe with a heightened imagination? You know what? That is the great question. Um, I tend to think that I'd like to believe he was the killer. <laughs> but I think especially in the movie version, you can interpret it in different ways. Uh, did it really happen? Uh, you know, I don't know. I In the book, because I read the book, in the book I felt it was really happening. But, you know, it's funny. I read the book when it came out, and, and I haven't read it since, although I do have it right up there. I, I'm a Brett Easton Ellis fan. So, I, 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 I mean, maybe in the movie it didn't happen. But then again, I think you'd have to go, it kind of did happen because Paul Allen disappears, and they're they're looking for him. But what I, if you, if you think that the, the movie, if it happened, if you want to believe that it happened, which I actually really like that idea, I like the interpretation it really happened, that the wealthy then swept it all under the carpet because, you know, it would look like he was a serial killer and they took care of it. If somebody was paid, not that Patrick Bateman was, but Patrick Bateman framed, was it Paul Allen? And so um, <laughs> the incredible wealth at the disposal of that family made sure that nobody knew what was going on because they, they didn't want to destroy their family uh, name. So um, it's a good question, Kevin. Um, I, you know, but that, that is a really good question. I just don't know the answer to that. But yeah, I like that. Let's go, Brandon. <laughs> Let's go, Brandon. What a uh, our meme world. Gosh, uh, Dune should have been a series like Game of Thrones on HBO instead of movies. Though since the movie is out, are you able to re-upload that video where you broke down and discussed the script since it's kind of no different than discussing the movie? I did. I did put the that episode back up. It is on the channel. I forget which, which number of episode it is, but I did put it back up and nobody cares. So um, that that is good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was able to, I was able to put it up so people can, um, uh, whatchamacallit, they can watch that again. But yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, there's a lot of things in the script that I missed in the movie. And it even ended in a different place. I mean, I know why they did it, but I really, really like the script, and I think the movie might have benefited. I, obviously, it was running long, but I think that there's ways that they could have uh, added added uh, those things in because uh, they. I did. I did. I did miss. I did miss some of those things. Well, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kind souls, gentle beings from across these, the 28 known galaxies, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, I'll be working all morning, so not uh, on the John Campy Show this week. However, uh, you will be able to see, again, the um, Designing Hollywood podcast on Friday where I interview the costume designer for the Eternals. And then remember on Observations on Friday... Uh, the Comic Doctor will be on, and we will be giving away a uh, um, a first edition, uh, issue number one, uh, 8.0, issue number one of The Eternals. So that'll be fun, and that'll be coming from the Comic Doctor himself, so I'll make sure you'll, you'll be sure to get it. And on that note, I want to say thank you to all my moderators. Oh, before, before I um, end the show, I would be remiss. I just want to mention that The Richard... Uh, is stepping down from his work here on the Burnett Work. He's, you've known him. You've loved him. He's been here for a long time. He's been a moderator, and he's been around these parts. He used to have watch parties and dance parties, and he's stepping down to... He's got a great new project he's doing, and he needs to. He needs the time to make that work. So I wish him all the best in his upcoming endeavor. I can't wait to see 
what the Richard will bring us. And um, I'm always encouraging of of everybody, you know, the people that do our, our moderating staff. They're an amazing group of people. And it's a volunteer it's a volunteer staff. So I want to thank you all for being great moderators. Uh, let's all wish the Richard a great journey to his next endeavor, which we will always support here on the channel the way we can. So I want to say uh, thanks to the Richard for all the work that he's done and everything he's done for the channel. So thank you, sir. And I can't wait again to see your, your, um, you know, your next endeavors. And I would also like to thank Darren Seeley and Justin Toner and Louise X Sparrow. I don't know who else was here. Was Joshua Levesque here today? I'm not sure. I don't know. But I want to thank you all for being great blue wrenches. Always exciting to have you. And I also want to thank people that support the channel via Super Chats and tips. Very much um, appreciated for that. And on that note, I would say this. Every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all we have to do, or all you have to do, is listen. And, with, and remind everybody, Tango Shalom is available all throughout North America on VOD platforms everywhere. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it everywhere please give it a look please watch it please support indie film the movie's already been ripped off all over the planet it's being uh it's being uh damn it it's being uh pirated everywhere i guess that's flattering but you know what for a low budget independent film like tango shalom every dollar it makes helps us pay back our investors so every time it's ripped off it bums me out so there you go and on that note i would say to all of you as you know have a better day, and thanks for being here.